All right, so this lesson is going to take a look at ancient Mesopotamia. And as we go through this, I want you to remember to use your SPICE graphic organizer to help, keep, help you keep track of the details. Um, in fact, I don't even know if you'd want to use Cornell Notes for this one. Uh, you may just want to make a big SPICE graphic organizer, leave yourself you know, three or four lines in each you know, box and uh, go through the lesson that way. I think that might actually be a little bit better. You could use Cornell notes if you wanted to, of course, but you know, I'll clearly label the spice elements in the Unit 1 lessons, but after that I won't. So I want you to get in this habit now. Um, you know, and I think it'll be easier for you if you interpret what you see in terms of spice. It's just going to help you, as I said in the spice lesson, just keep your thinking much more organized. And so really the story of Mesopotamia, as well as all the River Valley civilizations, Mesopotamia is one of them, is the interactions with the environment, right? And this, this part of the world is, is part of what's known as the Fertile Crescent, right? A crescent is the shape of a moon. You've got to kind of be a little creative to see a little bit of a moon here. Um, but this is a River Valley civilization uh, based on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, these two very important rivers that kind of come together right here. And this is actually Iraq, right? You can see Iran right here. Uh, this is modern day Iraq right here. Saudi Arabia is down here, Egypt, right? Israel right here. So, um, you know, modern day Iraq and, and very uh, important rivers uh, that had a big impact on the civilization, mainly because they flood um, in very irregular ways. Um, and in that flooding, they deposit very fertile soils along the banks. And so you've got good fertile soil, you've got lots of water, sometimes too much water. Um, and, and so this kind of made civilization possible in this area. The other thing that's you know, part of these interactions with the environment are these native grasses like wheat and barley and millet. Uh, we don't eat a lot of millet in, in modern America. We eat a lot of wheat and barley. Um, but these grasses are very easy to domesticate. And people noticed that um, you know, as they got seeds from certain plants and planted them in certain areas, they just they got more wheat or barley, more food. You got a food surplus, bingo, you got civilization, right? Um, the other big thing here, though, is irrigation, right? And irrigation is a fancy way of saying artificially bringing water to crops. Um, early on, the irrigation in this area was very much about creating pools and ditches to control the flooding, but also to capture that extra water. Like I said, the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers kind of have this problem of sometimes there's too much water, sometimes there's not enough. So people figured out if they could kind of bank that water and hold on to it, uh, and, and let it out a little bit at a time, they could you know, get their crops to grow well all year long. And so again, you know, here are these economic consequences, right? I'd put this in the E part of my spice graphic organizer if I were you, but you've got extra water, you've got domesticated plants, that equals surplus food. Remember, surplus is an extra, it's more than you need. Um, and again, this is the big underlying fact of, of civilization, right? You need surplus food, um, right? Because unlike hunter-gatherers, Mesopotamians could practice that labor specialization. Some people were farmers, some people were traders, some people were priests, some people were soldiers. And that's that big idea of labor specialization that, that we've looked at before. Right? And so one of the, I'm sorry, the first, the first big civilization that we're going to look at in this region is Sumer. Uh, Sumeria is the name of the region, and, and they get going right around 4000 BCE. Remember, when we're dealing with these old dates, we kind of have these loose numbers. But they were the first civilization to be able to take, it, or major civilization anyways, to take advantage of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, they had irrigation, they had surplus food, they had labor specialization, right? Um, and, and they were able to, you know, build certain key technologies that allowed their civilization to become strong. They had the wheel. They were able to use bronze, which is the metal used in this spear point here. They also developed star charts and other timekeeping technologies, as well as the concept of the 360-degree circle. So, you know, even in 4000 BCE, they're, you know, pretty sophisticated in their math and technology. Um, 
They also developed writing, which, you know, we want to think about writing all the time and, and what it can do, right? One of the big things for Sumer was using writing as, as a tool for social control. They were able to have organized taxation and know who'd paid their taxes and who hadn't. Very organized record keeping in terms of who owns what and who has sold what. And also system of laws. And we're going to look at some early Mesopotamian laws as a part of this project. Writing was also very important for science, right? As you, you, you've taken science classes, you know you have to collect a lot of data. And you need that data in order to make inductive observations and form hypotheses. So, you know, writing also helped in the sciences as well, right? Uh, politically, Sumer was, was pretty simple, right? They were a monarchy, they had a king, he ruled everything, period, end of story, right? He wrote the laws, he could change the laws, he kind of do whatever he wants. And they're organized into city-states, right? And uh, the way a city-state works is that the king rules a city and then the farm lands close by. So a city-state is kind of like a baby country, I think is the easiest way for you to think about it. Um, you know, and while the king ruled everything, he did have to have the support of the priests. He didn't have to have the support of the workers, but he had to have the support of the priests. Right? And the social organization was very much based on the control of land. Right? If you can control land, you can control food, you can control people. Right? And very patriarchal as well. And remember, the root word here, which is really easy if you speak Spanish, is father. Right? The father rules. Um, Right, the men owned the land, so they owned the food production, and then they owned the women. And so, yeah, you own land, you own everything. Uh, they also practiced slavery, which is very common in agricultural civilizations. Right, planting and harvesting is very difficult work, um, and usually civilizations opt to go with slaves. Um, culturally, they did write early epics, and we're going to read a selection from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, this is a very patriarchal warrior king, super warrior hero, interacts with the gods. I mean, we're studying this in English class as well, and, and Gilgamesh, as, you're, as you know or as you're going to see, um, has all the characteristics of a kind of Mesopotamian epic hero. He's the manly man, the ideal man, right? Uh, trade for Sumer was very limited, uh, mainly because of the technologies they had, their boats, were very simple and had to stay close to the coast. Uh, they did have draft animals uh, like horses and they did have carts, but not ocean going vessels. They didn't go super far. Uh, there was some limited trade as far as Britain, uh, you know, modern day England, as well as Afghanistan. And you can see Afghanistan on the map right here. This is modern day Afghanistan, but Britain's, you know, way off there, right? But the next empire to take over the area was the Akkadian Empire. Uh, and they were a true empire. And you should know the definition of empire here, right? It's a multi-ethnic, multi-state, or multi-kingdom political area ruled by an emperor and empress. So you've got all these little city-states all over the place here. And Akkad was able to kind of bind them together into this empire. But you can see it follows the rivers. It follows the Fertile Crescent. Uh, it's the same area and kind of the same people, but uh, united under the leadership of Sargon the First. Well, it sounds like it comes from Lord of the Rings, but uh, you know he's the Emperor of Akkad, and he's the first clearly identified individual in world history, which is pretty wild. You know, usually in history we study lots of names, uh, so to be the first name that we have is it's pretty cool, right? Uh, politically, they were a lot like. Um, you know, Sumeria, these smaller city-states, but like I said, united into an empire. And, and the key thing here is that they had a professional army, right? And we're probably used to that idea here in our civilization. We have a professional army in the United States. I mean, it's people whose job it is to be soldiers. Um, and for the time, a, a 5,400-man army, that's a big army. Uh, now, he had a very high tax base, right? And you need that tax base to support those soldiers. Um, the same way in the modern United States, we have these taxes to support our soldiers. And, and again, this was a necessary component, a necessary cause to build the effect. The effect here is the empire, right? The cause is the tax base and the, the soldiers, right? 
Uh, culturally, you know, Akkad was known for building these large ziggurats. You've probably seen them before. And like all big architecture done by kings and emperors, it's, you know, to show love of the gods and show respect for the gods, but also to show power, right? So whether you are a modern day religion, say, you know, Catholicism or Hinduism or Mormonism, or an ancient religion, you know, when you have these big, beautiful buildings, it shows how powerful you are, um, but it also shows how much you love your gods, right? Um, literature is also an interesting part of a cod, right? Sargon's daughter, Enheduanna, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the first writer known by name in world history, right? So, uh, and there's a key point here that you got to remember, right? Writing makes history, right? If you want to be a part of history, you better leave a written record. Um, and she did that. The political declines, you know, pretty standard. What Akkad faced is, is pretty much what all the, the Mesopotamian empires and kingdoms faced, was just invading armies. Um, this area is not well protected by mountains or oceans or anything like that, so you get a lot of turnover from invaders. And this kind of, like I said, sets the pattern of, you know, these city-states form, and then one city-state gets really powerful, and they kind of beat everyone up and create an empire, and then they start getting weak, and then they get invaded, and they fall apart, and then they start going back into city-states again. This is a pretty standard pattern in uh, regional history for Mesopotamia. Uh, next up is the Babylonian Empire. Uh, started in 1800 BCE after the, the fall of Akkad. This is another group of conqueror, organizer, empire people who, you know, kind of kick everybody's butt and pull them together. Um, and they're known, uh, I'm sorry, they're led by the very well-known king Hammurabi. And we're going to read Hammurabi's code. It's a very famous example of early laws. Uh, he wasn't the first person to write these laws down, but he's you know, kind of the best-known example. Um, I mean, they're very, you know, Hammurabi had a very sophisticated legal and government system of laws and taxes and ownership. And that may not seem like a big deal to you, but, you know, the last thing you want is people fighting themselves over who owns this or who owes what or, you know, laws kind of help people not to worry about what's going on inside their civilization so they can kind of worry about what's going on outside the civilization like trade or warfare or things like that. But, you know, as I said, like Akkad and Sumer, you know, Babylon, very similar, right? They were conquered by the Hittites who came from what is now modern-day Turkey to the, the north and the west, and they came down in and beat them up and broke down the empire. One of the things the Hittites had going for them was, you know, better metal, uh, better metal weapons as well as chariots. So they were pretty tough action there, right? And like I said, it was kind of basic pattern of Mesopotamian civilization until the rise of the Persian empires, and they, they would come from over here, actually further that way, um, you know, later on. And so that's it. Hopefully you have a nice, uh, robust um, spice chart here. And um, that's going to help you do some kind of cause and effect and compare and contrast connections in upcoming uh, writing assignments. So thanks for watching.